fossils and fossilization. So we all know the fossils, right? Fossils are old uh, animal that died maybe millions of years back, isn't it? So these uh, provide us very important clues on uh, the kind of biodiversity um, millions of years back, right? So this is like window towards the past, right? So the, the fossils are really, really important. And also fossils are really important as it serves as an evidence for the evolution. You know, so as per the scriptures of, you know, uh, most of the uh, religion, especially Abrahamic religion, uh, the earth is only 6,000 years old. So according to that kind of explanation, how would you explain the existence of fossils like dinosaur fossils? We have it. So that is why we have we, we have a empirical uh, way to date the fossils. So we have fossils which are millions of years ago. So how will you explain it? If you are a proponent of, for example, if you believe yourself in uh, uh, this kind of, you know, the creation myth, right, or intelligent design. So that means that evolution doesn't exist. It's everything is created just 6,000 years back by the God Almighty. So yes, so fossils provide a very important evidence to the process of evolution, you know. So let us see different kinds of fossils. So uh, only tiny fraction of the corpse fossilized. So fossilization is not like straightforward stuff. You know, there are so many uh, factors involved in the fossilization. So that is very, very important. So merely no fossil have been detected till date. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, su such things are non-existent. You know? We have a lot of proof, but we don't have all the fossils, you know, so of the, the thing. So there are so many, uh, you know, missing links. Right, so that maybe yet to uh, you know somebody else will some paleontologist will uh, find out. Right, so paleontology, by the way, is a study of fossils and fossilization, and uh, yeah, so it, we have only a tiny window that an organism fossilizes, means it, it turns into a uh, to a rock, and then the rock uh, somehow surfaces out, and uh, you know uh, excavation happens at right right at that particular. A site at the particular moment and if it doesn't happen then the rock uh, weathers away so we will be lost that fossil forever so that is the reason that we have very very uh, you know very very few fossils only available till date but that doesn't uh, invalidate the process of evolution you know so fossilization is basically about the tiny uh, filling the tiny spaces you know interleaving spaces the lattice work of bone and shells with new minerals. So mineralization is the term that means that filling up these spaces with different kinds of minerals, you know, like quartz or gypsum, whatever. And then the sediment surrounding this mineral deposit turns into a hard rock. So that is how the fossils are being formed. So basically it is in a fossil in, in a rock, you know, and once you cut open, you can see the fossil inside that rock, right? So sediments, yeah, so there is the it's a sedimentization, isn't it? Then after millions of years, this rock might be lifted, exposing the fossils. So it could be because of the uh, tectonic uplifting, you know, the natural process. Or maybe it's because of uh, a targeted mining or maybe it's because of the excavation, you know, especially in those fossil rich areas like Lagerstaden. And subsequently, uh, the, the rock and fossil weathers, that means er ero erode forever. So, you know, before this erosion happens, we have to detect this fossil. And that is the reason almost 99.9% .9 percentage of the whole fossils have gone. You know, we can never detect them back because it's, it's natural. You know, the, the weathering of rocks are really natural phenomena. There are different kinds of uh, fossils, including body fossil. That is the, the normal kind of fossil that might come to your mind is body fossils. You know, elements of original body of the ancient organisms like bones shells or teeth right and then other kinds of fossil this is these are basically the bo body fossil right you can see it here and the other kind of fossil is called trace fossils so that is something like something to do with the behavior like foodstuffs or burrow marks or something like that right so traces and structures recording the activity of the ancient organisms uh, yes burrows footprint or tooth mark bite mark right root marks of the tree or coprolite coprolite is feces you know feces of ancient organism right egg shells right all these are trace fossil 
right it's not something to uh, uh, it's not really body but uh, it provides us the clues about uh, the behavior of such organisms and finally we have chemical fossils so the chemicals are signatures of the life you know uh, also called biomarker the term biomarker we often use for detection of diseases like cancer isn't it so yeah so if you detect that chemical that means that uh, that shows that definitively there is an organism in that rock that has been living you know so these are relics of the biogenic organic compounds that may be detected geochemically in the rocks you know so uh, basically the detection is by iso isotope uh, chemistry right so isotopically enriched carbon or sponge compound or another very interesting compound is okinane okinane is a biomarker for chromatasia so that is basically purple sulfur bacteria right so if you see this okinane okinone changes into okinane by bioactivity only purple sulfur bacteria can do this uh, process so that is why if you detect this okinane that means that it has to be purple sulfur bacteria uh, at some point of its uh, you know the rocks history uh, purple sulfur bacteria might be living in it uh, recently a year back there has been a famous news you know phosphine gas in the cloud uh, the decks of the venus so again that is a biomarker for life phosphine gas found in the venus it's a landmark discovery by nasa but subsequent studies and reanalysis seemingly perplexing that it might be a spurious uh, conclusion so it is invalid assumption you know so the gas might not be phosphine but it must be sulfur dioxide simple sulfur dioxide which is common everywhere you know so sulfur dioxide per se uh, is not a biomarker for life but phosphine is right so how does the fossilization happens by the way the study of fossilization process is called taphonomy right taphonomy now unaltered is one of the very simple mode of fossilization that is simple burial and a little bit of the weathering of the rock happens right then permineralized permineralized means dissolved minerals precipitate in the pore space a lattice framework seen in many vertebrate fossils right so wherever there is a uh, the bond space uh, you know there are pore right these are hollow isn't it the bonds so you can see that uh, all these spaces turns into mineral so by the way mineral is natural occurring inorganic element of the compound or, or the compound having orderly internal structure and characteristic chemical composition so it's a crystallized crystalline form the minerals have and it has its own physical property that is how the mineral is defined you know now recrystallization basically is a change of one crystal to another you know calcite crystals reorder and grow into each other you know so original mineralogy remains but the structure is lost so because of this reordering you see uh, that is calcite is basically calcium carbonate this is how the crystal looks like right and because it is regrowing on each other the structure is uh, kind of lost so replacement means partial or complete replacement of the crystals of one mineral like calcite with another like ferric you know so completely the the uh, you know the the crystal uh, or mineral completely changes from one to another uh, it includes silicification silicification means replaced with silicate mineral so what is being replaced that is how that name is you know or pyritization replaced with iron sulfide that is fes2 right or phosphatization replaced with the phosphate ion that is po4 3 minus right now diagenesis the term is a change in the sediments of the existing sedimentary rock into a different sedimentary rock mineral or texture so it is actually starting materially sedimentary rock into something else that is called diagenesis right and carbonization means that carbon film left in place of the tissues so this may preserve outlines of the soft parts seen in some lagerstatin uh, deposits so lagerstatin that's a german word that means uh, places where there are a lot of fossils or very well preserved fossils are there in in the world only very few lagerstatin is there you know so those areas where you can see large number of fossils you know so that is uh, that is called the lacrostatin so carbonization basically is like soft tissue like muscles or skin you know so instead of that of course soft tissue 
we're completely gone very easily right the first thing that degrades when uh, you know when corpse decay is a soft tissue so in 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 the in place of soft tissue this carbon uh, you know carbon sheet uh, remains so that is very very excellent uh, you know excellent form or excellent examples to look you know for uh, for inferring about the past uh, i mean the ancient organisms soft tissues right so that is what you call it. now lagerstaden lagerstaden in german it means storage place like an attic right or, or or a treasure box that is called lagerstaden so lagerstaden means it's a region where unusually high concentration or conservation of fossils uh, these are uh, you know extremely important windows into the past right so there are two kinds of lagerstaden one is called concentration another is conservation concentration means that anomal uh, anomalously high amounts of fossil material uh, you know the uh, f number of fossil is very high so condensation deposit is an example where decreased rate of sedimentation happens right or placer deposit that means hydrodynamic concentration by the currents and eddies why how the, the fossils get concentrated right and then the concentration traps halls pits or caves all these are uh, some examples of the concentration lagerstaden where you can see a large number of fossils in it now conservation lagerstaden is another one which have not too many number of fossils but only a few fossils are there but these are excellent fossils preservation is unusually well you know so that those uh, regions so often require anoxic bottom conditions so basically in order to fossilize you don't need a lot of uh, decomposing bacteria right so bacteria should be less so you know so bacterial activity is proportional to oxygen right so you need to have anoxic environment where decomposition is minimal and it's also better to have it in a very cold place right so that decomposition doesn't happen that that far that uh, you know that fast isn't it so all these are some many factors that are important for the formation of the lagerstaden you know and quiet waters the bodies are not disturbed if the water is very agitated then of course that uh, corpse will uh, you know will um, uh, disintegrate into many parts so that fossil doesn't form rapid burial so after death so burial should be fast so if death after death if the scavenger is eating the corpse then uh, highly preserved corpse will not be formed right so it to reduce this rapid burial is a very important factor to reduce the possibility of mechanical destruction to the material right so uh, one example of uh, a conservation lagerstaden is stagnation deposits so autochthonous conditions of anoxia low current so autochthonous means built in you know so it is naturally anoxic and naturally low current so it is the eddies and whirlpools are not being formed in in the sea in those kind of sheltered habitats and then the conservation traps amber is an example of this conservation trap amber is uh, you know it's a tree resin plant resin in which some insects get trapped in right so amber is a uh, amber is also used as a jewelry isn't it so amber with some ants ancient and a very very exotic right fancy jewelry might fetch you uh, thousands of rupees maybe one lakhs of rupees isn't it some examples of the lacquer study include bugal uh, bugus shales so bugus shale is in uh, in canada you know and it is probably the most important lacquer study in the world because it is uh, you know it is basically yeah it has got unusually well preserved uh, you know specimen right so yes mazen creek uh, that is uh, basically in the united states green river again ixian formation in china chenjiang all those things are uh, the examples of the lagerstaden so you can read wonderful life by stephen j gold that is all about bogus shale and uh, its life of uh, uh, you know so uh, years ago isn't it so uh, the time of uh, a very important radiation right so we we have discussed about the radiation earlier right so bugus shale is very very important uh, you know so it is uh, yes yeah, so it's it's a very important lagerstaden this is where you can see the bugus shale where you can see various kinds of organisms like this one is definitely a trilobite 
while this one is a hallucinogenia you know that is yet another of a, a important fossil hallucin we have no clue there is nothing of the current day living uh, even remotely resembled this kind of organisms you know right so this is basically cambria right cambrian explosion that is the radiation so booker shale is a, a, a it's a preserved remnants of the cambrian explosion so of course there are so many bias at play for the fossilization for example you know these are called preservation bias hard parts preserve more easily than the soft part as i told you muscles are really tough uh, you know it cannot be preserved tough in the sense tough to preserve tough to form the fossil right Un unless there is a carbonization happens at the same time uh, you know the enamel of the tooth for example are very very hard parts so it can easily be preserved so marine environment preserve more easily than the terrestrial because the you know bacteria are much more or lesser it's oligotrophic right terrestrial are more prone for early erosion to uh, tectonic uplifting other factors include post-mortem transport and fragmentation and also energy level you know primary level uh, producer or higher trophic level you know decomposition much more rapid in a higher trophic level isn't it biological activity like predators and scavengers right temperature and humidity lower is always better low temperature and low humidity the preservation is much better right and then water chemistry like oxygen level anoxic environment is so much better isn't it at the burial site and the impact on the biological activity rate of burial fast burial is much better for the fossilization diagenesis or mineralization so diagenesis is you know changing in uh, from one mineral to another isn't it tectonic reworking of strata and erosion of strata everything contributes into the bias so some of the very famous fossil for the idiacara that is 560 million years back or dickinsonia then kimberella that is mollusk like then vernanimalcula you know so the consensus is the bilateral symmetry evolved during india current period so you know uh it's yeah so cambrian explosion is a phenomenon just after india cover right so just before cambrian explosion itself these fossils and these lineages have been uh, formed although the, the biodiversity is very very low then comes the booger shales uh, and xinjiang biota is the evidence of the cambrian explosion that something happened around 500 and uh, or 500 million years back, you know, 500 to 570, isn't it? Trilobites, which are definitely arthropods. Opabenia, which is arthropod relative. Marella is again arthropod. Vaptia is an arthropod. Vivaxia, that is a polychaete worm, which is related to mollusk, right? Hycostis, that is jawless vertebrate, and then hallucinogenia which is a relative of a velvet worms or arthropod. This is hallucinogenia, right? Vaptia, Marella, Opabinia, and Hycustis. All these are very interesting fossils, isn't it? So how do you bring the fossils to the life? So many, uh, you know, it's like an intersection of various fields of sciences working together. So you're doing comparative anatomy of the fossils uh, to aid in the phylogenetics, right? Uh, so remember, we already discussed the fossils uh, play a crucial role as calibration checkpoints in the you know time calibrated phylogeny that is called time trees right if you want to limit the time like the millions of years ago in x-axis so you need to find some uh, node as the fossils the dated fossil you know and fossils can preserve the ancient organisms behavioral patterns too the trace fossil for example here there's a very interesting uh, fossil of the ichthyosaur uh, which is basically the fish like uh, you know fish to reptile uh, you know the transition you can see that one is eating the another right so you, you can see that which are its uh, uh, prey organisms of this predator all those things you can find it and here is another example uh, you know this is basically a, a paper published in biological letters an ant associated mesostigmatid mite in the baltic amber so you know see this is an ant right and there is a mite here so ant and mite right so yes so it's a predator prey relationship isn't it? it's very well preserved and well of course this is an amber baltic amber by the way amber you know amber is a fossilized tree resin 
that has been appreciated for its color and its natural beauty since Neolithic time. So it is really old form of jewelry, right? So you can see that in one amber, you can see the kind of an insect or ant in it, right? It could be anything. And also, how do you bring the fossils to life to say that, okay, this is this used to be the life of the fossil. So you can do a lot of interesting things like math modeling or scanning electron microscopy or three-dimensional CT scan, <laughs> you know. Uh, yes, you can, you can do the CT scan for the fossils or even mummies, right? Egyptian mummy, you can do the CT scan to, uh, to see how the mummification happens or, or what is inside or what kind of wound the, the mummy have. Right, all those things you can you can do it. It's, it's an exciting field, I can say. So it can further reveal the fossils' features. For example, math modeling of Tyrannosaurus rex leg muscles. Uh, you know, so uh, the interpretation it cannot run fast. So if you have seen Jurassic Park or Jurassic World, you know the Hollywood interpretation of Tyrannosaurus rex was faulty. In those movies, this you know this uh, uh, foss, uh, this you know dinosaur is portrayed as fast running. It cannot run that fast, you know. So scientifically inaccurate depiction, right? So Tyrannosaurus rex, the rex in Latin means king, king of dinosaurs, you know. Size, shape, and organization of melanosomes of uh, Anchionis huxley helps scientists to reconstruct its striking plumage. It's a bird. Right, fossil bird. So how its feathers had been, though we don't have any feather, but still, if you do this, uh, you know, in the in using the scanning electron microscopy and how this melanosome uh, are uh, arranged, then you can reconstruct. You know, very interesting, isn't it? So this is how the reconstructed plumage of this uh, Anch Anchionis huxley. This plumage we don't really have it, but still by looking at the melanosomes, uh, you know, how it is, uh, it's being distributed, you can see it, you can reconstruct, but we don't really know that it's, it's the, re the accurate reconstruction or not, but whatever the proof we have, this is how it would have been looked like, right? It's very interesting. We are bringing these fossils to the life. Sound of hadrosaur from the CT scans of its skull, hadrosaur is another dinosaur, how it would have been sounded like by uh, taking the CT scan of it. No? And also growth patterns of the trilobites, how the trilobite is growing, all those things you can do. This is a hadrosaur. It's a head, the skull part, you know, crust and brain. And if you do the CT scan, then you will see that this appendage had been a tool for amplifying the, the voice, you know, like the speaker. So you can uh, you can do this reconstruction. You can check, check it in the YouTube for a hadrosaur's uh, sound. You can you can st still see that. Of course, this is uh, uh, you know it is uh, basically a reconstructed. So it's based on the model that we have it. You know, and then the growth patterns of the trilobite. So it's uh, there is a term called allometry. If you have read old uh, uh, you know papers of gold or the book popular science books of um, gold and uh, other such people you know so you can see the term called allometry so allometry this is how the growth uh, you know how that um, this basically the cephal cephalic region cephalic length versus cephalic width so if you grow and how the width is increasing so it is basically linear right the correlation is linear so it's basically the correlation right of two factors it's in statistics so you can see that as the length increases the width increases how about human being is it the same kind of growth form do we have not really right so our we are actually growing that getting taller bigger than the width wise isn't it so if it is not the case if we are also doing uh, i mean we are also following this kind of growth pattern then uh, you know we will be bigger and fatter right as the uh, as we age you know, as tall we become, as fat we become. That is not the, the case, right? But trilobite follows this kind of growth pattern. So that is exactly what uh, you call it as. Uh, you know, this, uh, uh, the uh, yeah, this the study about this kind of growth pattern is known as allometry, you know? So study of relationship between body size to its shape, anatomy, physiology, and finally behavior, right? So on growth and form is a very exciting book. Of course, it's a popular science book. Uh, DRC Thompson, right? Uh, check it out. That book is a fantastic. It's highly accessible book, though it is very old book. 
you can see old english written in that book right so check it out that allometry is a fantastic one so of course we have uh, uh, yeah so different kinds of paleontological evidences are uh, one of the key evidence for the support of uh, you know for uh, theory of evolution so paleontological evidence means it's a record of all fossils ever discovered which demonstrate the changes in the organism structure over time if you look back in time same way in phylogeny we are working with dna sequences uh, paleontologists work with the, the fossils right so we also have few transitional fossil fossils or transitional forms which are called missing link uh, which have been found to show the relationship between ancient forms to the modern forms you know uh, yes so like tiktalic from uh, fish to vertebrate you know four limbed vertebrate so fossils can be dated radioactively uh, radiometric dating you know to determine its age accurately again that actually shows that it's well beyond 6000 years as in the creation myth right in intelligent design theory that contradicts uh, charles darwin's theory of evolution says that the life on earth is just 6000 years old then how radiometrically dating these fossils it is you know five uh, million years or even up to three million years isn't it uh, two million i can say some of the fossils are really really old so maybe you, you know as per the creation myth the creator who, who did uh, enter work uh, deliberately also created these fossils to mislead us you know so that is the god's own statement isn't it and dated fossils serve as the calibration checkpoints for time calibration of phylogenetic trees which i have already explained to you for construction of the the time tree so fossils are really important windows to the past 